as uh, were presented before. And my topic today is talk about the uh, BCC update 2022 in the setting of this webinar that is treating outside the guidance. This is my conflict of interest. And before talking about the BCC staging system, I would like to highlight the evolution of the BCC staging system since 1999 was, was uh, presented at the first time to the version that we have now in 2022. As you can see here, the evolution of the staging was modified according to the prognosis factor, but also in terms of treatment. And as you can see here, the last version have more than the overall survival and the characterization of patients. So this is the 2022 version. Just to make my presentation on time, I will focus on the novelties of that. As you may know, the BCC staging system have five stages. We didn't modify this fair part of the figure. However, we add this part of the figure to characterize the prognosis based on characteristics such as alpha fetoprotein RD, child to score men that makes sense to consider in our clinical practice. And I will talk about that later on. Then we have the second part that is the patient characterization in the setting of intermediate OTC. We have three profile of patients in this group, those who are candidates for chemoembolization due to the selective super selective access. However, some of them is not feasible to do that and we could consider as first line treatment systemic therapy. However, on the other side, we have some patients who have all the lesions inside the liver, meet the criteria for expanded criteria, and could be considered for liver supplementation as the first line treatment. Keep in mind all of this characterization. We also characterize a subgroup of patients within the BCCA that have high portal hypertension, but could be candidate for a specific uh, treatment that is resection. And I will talk about that later on. However, maybe the most important part is this part, the clinical decision making, and it is more aligned with the topic of this session. That is, how do you treat the patient in your clinical practice, regardless of the stage of the treatment and the recommendation? How do you deal with this connection? And the last part that I would like to emphasize this uh, part, the red box, that makes sense for this treatment that they are not evidence-based data in terms of overall survival, but we have data in terms of safety profile response, and we could consider in the setting of the, la the changes in the landscape of HSC. And this is mainly the topic of my uh, presentation. So let's go directly to the uh, aim of this presentation. At the very end, in our clinical practice, we need to extrapolate the evidence base to clinical practice. And this is the goal of the BCLC staging system. We characterize the patients, define the best treatment option based on overall survival response, and this link with the expected overall survival for these profile patients. However, in clinical practice, we need to go beyond that. We need to consider also the treatment stimulation concept that is something that is in the BCC from the beginning, but now we put in the figure to emphasize this consideration that maybe in some cases were not considered when interpreting the BCC station system. So at the very end, clinical practice is physician and multidisciplinary team responsibility. In this version of the BCC 2022, we incorporate the shared decision making that again responsible for the team that is treating the patients and also the value based health care. That means the decision is relation between patients, physician, and considerations in their area. And maybe this can explain or will be more precise at the time of interpreting the BCC station system. So let's go directly to the clinical decision making, physician team responsibility. We decide the treatment based on the stage of the tumor. However, we also consider all of us in our clinical practice, the age, the comorbidities, the patient value, the treatment availability, the location, the technique, if we're talking about ablation, if we're talking about surgery, laparoscopy open, or if we're talking about local regional treatment, what kind of treatment or particles that you can use in one or another. It's impossible to put all of these factors in a specific uh, classification. That's why we prefer 
to maintain the structure, the, the simplicity of the BCC station system and delegate the responsibility for doctors for this specific decision that you can do in your clinical practice. So keep in mind all of these consideration, it's also important to mention, and it was also presented in the introduction of the seminar, that the BCC station system is the, the strategic system that is used around the world and it is the system that we can use as a parameter to go beyond the BCC or within the BCC. It is the same that happened in the literature presentation with the Milan criteria, or if you are talking about any criteria, if you use resist criteria, if you follow or not, you follow the criteria. So keep in mind that it's a criteria you can do in your clinical practice according to your beliefs, but also according to the evidence value that you can use to support or not your decision. So when I received the invitation, I believe, okay, how do you manage this discussion? The first question that appeared to my mind is how do you define outside the BCC guidelines? And the second question is, how do you follow the BCC? Do you follow the figure? Do you follow the algorithm plus figure plus text? Or do you really follow the BCC, including the treatment stimulation concept? For those who are only use the figure, I advise you to consider the figure and the text. And for those who use the figure and the text, also incorporate the treatment stimulation. If you ask the, the, the physician, do you follow the BCLC? Maybe some of them say no, but when you consider follow the BCLC based on the treatment stimulation, more doctors saying yes, because at the very end, I follow the BCC, but without considering the, the, the concept of untreated progression or treatment stimulation. So keep in mind this consideration and go directly to the BCC staging system. Here is one of the modifications for those patients who are BCC A, single lesion, increased portal hypertension, but peripheral lesions, and with adequate remanent, we could consider the resection. And here you have the evidence to support this recommendation. However, this version of the BCMC does not recommend resection in multinodular ATC with an Milan criteria. And the question is why? Here you have two publications that we use in the um, publication that we did in 2022 to support that. There are many publications in this regard. However, we do not, we didn't identify a strong robust data to support that in the recommendations. And I will, I will go to these two presentations and the following slide. The first one is a randomized trial, the SERF study that randomized resection versus radiofrequency. And as you can see here, identified lesions with less than three centimeters, less than three centimeters each of them. And here you have the result for current free survivors equal between both. However, when you focus in the multinodular ATC, the numbers are very, very low, 15 patients in each arm. So that's not really enough to give a recommendation. The second publication compared liver resection versus stays, thousands of patients. However, when you go to the methodology, the resection was the first line treatment. However, days was considered where the patient is not candidate for that treatment. So at the very end, they are not comparing patients between each other. The BCC station system was significantly different between one to the other. But the most important thing, when you go to identify patients with the Milan criteria, the numbers are low and it is not easy to give a recommendation in this regard. But that's not enough to support the recommendation. If you go to other publications, and in this case, I prepared three publications, one from Italy, the second one from China, and the third one for Japan, because across the world, we have different techniques, different expertise, different profile of patients. We have the same consideration. The first one, it is considering the use of the um, probability of cure, fraction of cure, in patients beyond BCLCA. And when you go to the multi, the, the, this analysis, they're significantly different if you consider one lesion or more lesion. And that's why we don't consider it beyond one lesion, the resection in our classification. The second one is from China. In this case, they analyze the patient who developed recurrence according to the pattern of recurrence, but also they could consider the multivariate analysis to predict the risk of recurrence and overall survival. 
Again, if you focus in the number, the number single versus multiple have an impact also macrovascular invasion. That is another area that is under discussion. It is resection is facing for this type of patient. So at the very end, all of us are discussing the same, but we do not have enough data to support this as a recommendation. The last publication that identified that it could be useful to use is this one from Japan. They developed an algorithm to predict the risk of death and risk of recurrence. Again, a free macrovascular invasion and tumor volume. And again, if we focus on this uh, publication, solitary lesions are completely different as multiple lesions. And again, when they identify as a predictor of 90 days mortality, patient with low risk, that means single lesion, they are 0% of mortality of 90 months, 90 days, sorry. But it is increased and is significantly higher in the other. For all of these reasons, we still believe that there are not enough data to support in the recommendation. And that's that about the resection in the setting of, on the controversy in the setting of uh, early stages. The second area is the use of radioembolization or TACE after uh, patients who are not candidate for uh, the first line treatment or the treatment was not uh, sufficient enough to um, control the disease. TACE is very well known and is not needed to discuss in this presentation. However, in the setting of radioembolization is the good example for a treatment. There are not evidence-based data to support benefit in terms of overall survival, but we have data in terms of control response and also in terms of safety. However, when you focus in the legacy study, the median size of the lesion was 2.6, single lesion 2.6, so we are here. And that's why we put in the second step and not at first line two. This data was validated by another study similar to the previous one with similar results and this is from United States. So we have evidence, that, evidence to support the response rate in this specific population, but that does not mean that we can use radiomolization for advanced ATC where we don't have this data at this day. They are not data in comparison to the current treatments in the standard of care that is at this available treatment. So that's that about resection, radiomolization in uh, early stages. What about intermediate ATC? Here we have the patients that are candidate for taste, evidence to, to support the streaming. However, we have patients that could be candidate for a standard criteria of uh, liver transplantation. In this regard, we decided to do not consider a specific criteria because the heterogeneity around the world is very, very high. And we also have data from the clinical trials for patients who have all the, the, the lesions inside the liver, but they are not candidates for embolization, and we could consider systemic therapy. But the, the point that I would like to highlight here is more than the evolutionary event, the evolution of the characterization, the clinical decision making in this population. We can consider first line treatment, which is not feasible, we can move to the right to other treatment. But at any time that you are having a decision, you need to consider the training treatment integration means the characteristic of patient. And in terms of the evolutionary event, we can have downstaging in the setting of liver transplantation. The recommendation is low to liver transplantation. However, in patients who are beyond intermediate ATC, if the patient develops downstaging in a gray area, at this day, they are not robust data to support any recommendation. And that's why. We didn't do that in the last version. The most frequent scenario are patients that develop untreated progression, so there is need to move to another treatment. Again, characterize the patient based on that, you take a decision. And in this setting, you have several options in advanced in liver disease or systemic liver disease, at the Sovet, Chenodurva, if it's not feasible, TKIs or the Valumab. However, when you try to do the sequencing beyond seraphine treatment, all of the data that we have, it is not support, but evidence-based in terms of overall survival, and that's why we prefer to be more conservative and propose clinical trials. However, in many, many areas or many centers, we do not have the clinical trial. The patient doesn't need the criteria for clinical trials. In this case, we support the use of alternative sequence, but again, under responsibility of the doctors who are responsible for the patient. It is not feasible to give 
a list of options because there's an, a, a lot of options that we can use without support of the editors. So this is the picture that we have in the setting of systemic therapy. I believe that this is the limited time that we have. We do not have enough time to discuss each of them and maybe we can discuss later on with uh, Lorenza Remassa, but the main uh, decision is consider that all the treatments both at the Sover, Dura, Feme, or Lemba Dura are treatments that are not supported to an evidence-based sequence yet we could consider the clinical trial. If not, we go to the alternative and you can discuss the different options in your uh, team. Again, this box is very, very important. SBRT appear here. Also, the sequence if you could consider sorafenib, lembatinib, or uh, divalumab after the first line treatment that demonstrate benefits in terms of overall survival in comparison to sorafenib treatment. But at the very end, we are discussing to go beyond the criteria. How do you deal with that? When would you consider going beyond the criteria? When you have more than one option that improve overall survival, you need to take a decision. And in this case, there are not consensus around the world. If you could consider these criteria, safety, rational response, real good data, quality of life, each physician, and here you have six physicians, could have different algorithms. At the very end, the decision is between the team and the patient. And the patient take the decision based on the information that you have. That's why I support the idea that the doctors are responsible to give information and is responsible to have the, the rules data to support one treatment or other and have the capacity to explain that for the patients. For all of these reasons, if I need to summarize my presentation, how should we change the uh, current algorithm? If you want, you can. You want write the idea, develop the protocol, demonstrate the benefits of that, and we have a very good example in the last version of the BCC of this situation. However, keep in mind that clinical decision making is your responsibility, and the BCC 2022 considered treatment immigration sharing the decision making with patient value based transfer. And a good example of that is the use of some treatment or consideration or proposed some treatment that we do not have evidence based in terms of overall survival, but you have in terms of response and safety profile. And that's why I'd like to finish with this uh, picture that is the BCC group and also the collaborator for the guidelines with 2022. And the best example for that is Ray Salem. He started working in randomization for many, many years ago. He demonstrated that it's a profile of patient that we can use that, and now it's part of the BCC station system. The same thing happened with Professor Masafero. He works in this area, and in a specific group of patients, we also incorporate that. And having said that, I'd like to thank again for giving me the uh, opportunity to share the cooking of the BCC and how to discuss with you in the discussion part. Thank you. Again. Thank you.